This was the Xbox 360 flirting game. I'm the leader of the clan, but not the leader of the YouTube, but yeah. I'm gonna be like the jokester sort of guy, so yeah. One of the best and coolest you had to have been there moments from the Xbox 360's lifetime was definitely the Xbox Live indie games. These were a collection of games made by small developers or groups of like a couple of people with not a lot of funding and you could pick up the games for like next to nothing and sometimes these games were absolutely wild experiences like really really bizarre stuff and they were kind of awesome. There was something really special about some of these games that were sometimes really weird but also really cool like for instance there was this game called impossible avatar getaway and it was like this parkour type game that used your xbox avatar as goofy as it was and i'll be honest for however much this game was it wasn't expensive this game was kind of awesome it was incredibly frustrating and quite a bit challenging but still a really unique game but that wasn't everything that there was we're gonna be doing a deep dive on some of these really weird things like a massaging game for your xbox controller what is this yeah okay so the xbox live indie game service essentially actually started out just shortly after the release of the xbox 360 in 2005 now on the original xbox live service there were already a couple of small xbox live arcade games that were showing up and these games were always like very very minuscule basic level games there was never like full games on demand type features where you could buy a retail game on your original xbox back then and going into the xbox 360s life that would also be true though while more studios were starting to embrace the idea of just having an xbox live arcade game some smaller developers who were like individuals just trying to like make some cool games and whatnot could utilize the software known as the xna game express 1.0 which released in 2006 to at the very least make your own games and this was an awesome starting point for a lot of game developers but things really got hyped in 2008 when microsoft and xbox announced that they would be bringing individual games that were created by the community to the marketplace and could be monetized through Xbox Live and people could buy the games with Microsoft points, which it was just like the currency back in the Xbox 360 days. You just spent like 10 bucks to get 800 Microsoft points. They ended up doing away with the whole Microsoft point thing later on. Now the full indie game service launched in 2009 and when that thing launched, it was a huge deal for a bunch of small developers to finally get the exposure and discoverability from just any Xbox player scrolling through to see what's going on in the store. And while there were a lot of guidelines for the games, like how large the files could be, very quickly some crazy games started to pop up here and there. One of the biggest games that I very vividly remember getting on my Xbox 360 was a little game called Murder Miners. It was like a hybrid game inspired by something like Minecraft and Halo put together, and that's kind of how they advertise the game, though honestly when you play the game it doesn't really feel anything like Minecraft or Halo, but at the same time, it's its own thing. And that's kind of cool. You can shoot at people and build stuff, I guess. There was this other game that kind of felt reminiscent to one of those old addicting games type games called Speedrunner HD. I mean, look at you go. And you know what? My friends might have thought I was weird every time I jumped on this game called, oh god, Baby Maker Extreme. Weird name? surprisingly not the worst indie game I've ever played. I mean, the gameplay is, is this. This is essentially what Baby Maker Extreme was. It's not, it's not anything overly bad, but the name of the game itself does pique the attention of uh, like people who might not be interested at first. They'll be wondering what on earth that game is. Now, another important thing you have to remember is that during the earliest times of the Xbox 360 days, Minecraft was blowing up on PC, but Minecraft was not available on Xbox 360 yet. So the indie game platform became a huge source for multiple Minecraft-like games or Minecraft clones that a lot of players tried out and it would kind of fill the gap of wanting to experience something Minecraft related when the Xbox 360 didn't have Minecraft at the time. I mean, Castle Miner Z was a huge one that we've talked about before on this channel and we'll talk about again in a minute, but Luke went through and went back and studied and researched all these old Minecraft-like games once again just for this video, so let's let him explain 
explore this topic this time. In 2010, a game called Minecraft popped up and started having its first alpha and beta releases, and it became hugely popular on the PC gaming side of things. Now it became so popular that there was a whole sub-genre of Xbox 360 indie games that would try to emulate Minecraft, before Minecraft would officially release on the Xbox 360 in 2012. And obviously the biggest one of these, and I think the one everybody kind of knows, is Castle Minor C. But this was basically Minecraft, but with guns. And it also had this mechanic where you had your home base and it would tell you how many blocks away you are from your home base. And that was kind of the goal, to go as far out as possible. So while at heart it kind of was a Minecraft knockoff, it did have its own spin on the whole thing. Which is something I can't really say about Total Miner, which was another Minecraft knockoff, but this one was just straight up Minecraft. Now there's nothing wrong with that, but I mean, you know, I still find it funny that there was such a big market that someone programmed this and quickly put it out before the 360 release just to cash in on some of the hype of Minecraft. And as I said, this is pretty much like Minecraft. You have your stuff, you mine stuff, you build stuff, you have a crafting bench and stuff like that. You have chests. From what I remember, this was the closest experience you could get at the time to vanilla Minecraft. Another one of these Minecraft type games was called Fortress Craft and this one kind of leaned more into the Tashnik or like factory side of things. Kind of like the popular Minecraft mod pack Tacket. So this one once again kind of took its own spin and kind of like did something different which I got a commended for. And I mean there's nothing shameful for playing any of these because I mean what else are you gonna do? The most popular game in the world just came out and it's not on your platform. You might as well play the knockoffs. Now we gotta go a little deeper for this next one because if you guys know the game Terraria, it obviously kind of combines Minecraft gameplay with like Metroid side-scrolling style or I don't know what else to call it. And that game itself kind of became also very popular on PC. There was Miner Dig Deep that kind of filled the void. Now don't get me wrong here, I'm not calling this a Terraria knockoff. This game actually came out in 2009, which is I think two years before Terraria even started development. So it's kind of interesting to see this and it's very like basic in its art style, but I mean, you know, you just kind of dig down you do some cave splunking and and that's kind of the same experience Terraria would offer. So this game also was kind of popular at the time. I also vividly remember after the hype of what The Walking Dead was on television, like you guys remember that time. The first couple of seasons were fire and everybody was like on board with that. During that time, zombies were back in style. These were cool and there was a lot of games out there. And one of the coolest PC games was DayZ at the time, especially before they did like the whole standalone thing and you could like accidentally break your legs because of a glitch and die and lose all your hours and hours and hours of work. So while DayZ was like blowing up on PC and people were watching all these like YouTube videos showing this game off and how cool it was, it was just like The Walking Dead but in video game form. Xbox didn't have that but what the indie game store had that we didn't know we needed was a knockoff of DayZ called Apoc Z. I hate the fact that I spent hours and hours on this game and I rarely even ran into like actual players. Most of the time you go to the spawn area which was kind of near the water and you would like run into someone else who spawned in and you might like fight it out or something and then like you died or you killed the person and they didn't have any loot anyways. But one time I ran into some other kid playing the game and uh we started talking and we worked together and we looted a bunch of stuff and we got a car and we got the car fixed up and we drove around a bit and we explored. You know this game kind of had a like a, a weird thing with the zombies where they were manageable but also still a little threatening. Like they were never too much of a risk like actual Daisy but um I don't know they're kind of goofy too. Nonetheless this is like a sad tragic version of Daisy here and um I always wondered what happened to that kid I played up Apoxy with those few times but man what an experience this game truly was. Did anyone else ever play the game Pirates vs Ninjas Dodgeball? I mean why not? Take two popular historical character types I guess and pin them together to play dodgeball what could go wrong uh dodgeball video games are always really weird to me I feel like they're uh kind of awkward they don't really like translate as well in video game form so maybe that's why they threw the pirates and the ninjas in there and you know what why not and then there was a game called Mount Your Friends, which sounds inappropriate, but this game actually was really, really fun. Not only is it one of those games that has like those really weird, goofy controls, and there's a lot of uh, moments that can make you laugh out loud, I guess, but this game was awesome because it was so inexpensive on the indie store, you could probably convince one of your friends to buy it real quick. And then playing the game itself is actually kind of fun and addicting. You take turns essentially placing characters on top of other characters and trying to build this tower as high as you can and each turn players have to take turns trying to get their character higher than the previous person's turn and 
um, it can lead to some hilariousness, but also a bit of competition. And I mean, it's a unique idea. It was a genius idea for the indie game store. And I'm kind of surprised that like this game didn't make a release on just regular Xbox stores after the 360 era ended. I'm surprised we can't play Mount Your Friends on the Xbox Series X now, but um, this one was a neat one. There also was this game called uh, Kingdom for Cleflings? Cle Clef? Keflings! Keflings! Uh, this one was interesting. You go around and like build these like little houses up and you do stuff. Your Xbox avatar is in it and that's really cool. This game would later on be released in a wider scale besides just the Xbox 360 version of the game. Like you can buy it on the Xbox store or on Steam, but the Xbox avatar is not there. But there was something goofy about seeing your Xbox avatar just like doing this other type of game. These were wild and trying times. On the other hand, there was this really weird comedy club type game. Honestly, I was surprised this game even got approved into the Xbox store at first because there's no real game here. It's essentially a chat room with your Xbox Live avatars all in this makeshift, weird looking comedy club type place. I gotta say, this game was absolutely wild, unhinged, and probably rightfully so for games that are not rated by the ESRB, questionable. There were some weird people you could meet on there. And essentially like people have power to give control over who is on stage in the game. And people People would just get on stage and just start blabbering on about some of the random things that they like randomly came up with. This led to some bizarre out there moments and just reminded you why like you don't spend all day playing Call of Duty listening to Call of Duty lobbies because it ends up diabolical or just nonsensical like what we had in this game. Still it was an interesting concept. I think it ended up getting delisted well before the indie games shut down altogether so Microsoft probably had a problem with the format of this game. This also was the case for a couple of like random dating games that popped up over the time that the indie games were accepting games, where those would also get kind of pushed off the platform after a little bit, and rightfully so. Does this game though count as a game? Uh, maybe? It's like a social space really, but it fell under the indie game, so here we are. Okay, then there was a handful of these really wacky and bizarre massage controller games. These things were very weird that they existed. Essentially, they were games that would allow you to control the vibration and rumble of your Xbox 360 controller, people. What are you guys doing? I guess the idea was to use your controller as like a massage tool. Oh geez. But then if you had the full indie version of the game, like you purchased it, it did have online connectivity so someone else could control the speed and vibration of your Xbox 360 controller from somewhere else in the world by joining the game session. This is this is um something else. Uh, I honestly it doesn't surprise me this thing existed, but it also does surprise me that this wasn't taken off of the store immediately. And um, yeah, I'm still kind of surprised that this existed. You know what though? During the early days of the Xbox Indie Showcase or Indie Games that they had on there, there was some really awesome things like we've looked at and what we're going to get into here that you could do instead of you know just playing the same old games that had already been in the Xbox Arcade Store for a while. I'm looking at you, Trials HD. That game was really fun, and you had a free trial with it but if you bought it you had the full version of the game and then you're expected to beat it and those achievements at the end are really really challenging i am getting sidetracked but games like trials hd there was you know things like doritos crash course that existed those games were wild but technically were xbox live arcade games these indie games did more niche things instead of doritos crash course we had avatar drop it's a game where you try to drop as your avatar as fast as possible, I guess? You want to just like do your thing and go through the rings. And it is a very goofy thing seeing your Xbox avatar just having the time of his life skydiving down this shoot, I guess? It's always goofy to see your Xbox avatar playing some of these random games. Like, why are you in Castle Miner Z? What are you doing over here? And I have to say, when these games re-release later on and they don't have the Xbox avatar, like a kingdom for the the Keflings or whatever it's pronounced. It always just feels slightly out of place with the new mascot being this like generic looking character. The same thing happened in Castle Miner Z, same thing happened in a couple of other games. It's a shame, but I understand why Microsoft didn't want people using the iconic and like identifiable Xbox avatars as their avatars in games where you could be like violent towards each other. It's kind of an L, but like at least some of those games continue to live on. But with the avatars being such a huge part of the Xbox ecosystem, it is also no surprise that there was a bunch of Xbox indie games that would heavily 
fully feature your avatars. Now the first one that came to my mind was Avatar Warfare. And looking at the cover, hmm, I'm not sure. It kind of looks like they're ripping off Black Ops 1 a little bit here. And yes, it doesn't just stay at the cover. The map that they have kind of is similar to Nuketown or very Nuketown-esque. It's more of a roundabout though, instead of being like a street with two houses on each side. So it's kind of weird. But yeah, I mean, this game featured your avatar and realistic weapons. And there would be like free for all game types. And then once the lobby filled up, it would be a team deathmatch. There was like this dynamic game type switching thing going on. It was kind of weird actually. And gameplay wise, it was really shallow. But I mean, what do you expect for the price? It's not like you paid a lot for this. Similarly, there was the third person shooter called Avatar Paintball that obviously lets you shoot paintball guns. And that kind of was all there is to it. I mean, this one, at least you get to see your own avatar in third person view, which I guess is kind of nice if you paid for some cool shirt or something. And I mean, this time the map was like this cartoon town, I guess. It wasn't like a neighborhood like in the other one, but it still wasn't like a crazy big map. And then another Xbox avatar FPS was Avatar Laser Wars 2. And this is kind of like a more like Quake or Halo type arena style shooter, I think, where you shoot other avatars with laser guns, as the title might imply. Apparently Apparently this one had a global high score list, so I guess that's kind of cool because, you know, at least then you got something to compete for. And I mean, control wise, all of them were probably playable, and I mean, you couldn't expect too much once again because of the cheap entry price to get this game. Then there was Avatar Survival Games, which is kind of like based off the Hunger Games, as you can tell from the cover. But then obviously the popular Minecraft game mode Hunger Games is also inspired by the Hunger Games, so this kind of also rips off Minecraft in a way. You would spawn in, you wouldn't have a weapon, you would have to go loot stuff, and then it would be a free fall and whoever is the last man standing wins. Now I do have to say I don't think in 2013 when this game came out Minecraft Hunger Games was playable on the Xbox 360 because I don't think there was like mods and custom servers at the time so this was probably your only way to experience a Minecraft Hunger Games type game on the Xbox 360 at the time. I mean there's one more that I want to dive into but there was also like a lot of random ones like Avatar Boogie or Avatar Golf or Avatar Ninja or Avatar Slam Dunk. There's just so many of these Avatar games. And lastly was the really bizarre Avatar Legends game, which was like a Elder Scrolls type RPG, but with your avatars, and it looks so, so shallow. I watched a little bit more gameplay of this, and from what I can tell, it's like, you go talk to an NPC, the NPC tells you to go somewhere, you go talk to the other NPC that the NPC told you to talk about, and then sometimes, between these interactions where you go from point A to B to point C or whatever, you do get to fight some mobs, and I don't know, it's kind of goofy looking. But once again, I want to say these games look weird, and like they kind of look bad but at the time I mean for the price it was kind of fun to just like dive in and you know maybe have like a fun night or two with your friends on these so even though I wouldn't say they were great games they were great entertainment. Now of course towards the end of the Xbox 360 life with full games now releasing on the Xbox marketplace regularly and that being more accepted there was the whole games with gold program arcade games were also really really starting to become a bigger presence in the Xbox store though the arcade tab itself and the difference between arcade games and regular games was starting to blur a bit. It also seemed like indie games were kind of just being like lumped up together, being compared very similarly to what was coming out over on like the arcade side of things. There were a lot of really inexpensive arcade games starting to come out, almost following the business model of Xbox Live indie games. Like for instance, I remember buying this game called Hole in the Wall, which was very obviously a very low budget connect game, but it technically was an arcade game, though it pretty much could have been on the indie store. It was based on that TV show where people have to like fit into like shapes while like a moving platform comes by them but in this one you get to use a connect and uh it didn't work all that well, but I remember playing this game a lot, trying to fit into these weird shapes. It was a really weird concept for a game. With more and more small studios though, being able to get their games into the arcade side of the marketplace because Xbox was more accepting to more arcade games, the need for an indie marketplace specifically did start to shrink quite a bit. And by the end of the Xbox 360's life, was there really that much of a difference between the indie games and some of the games that were showing up on the arcade side of things? I mean, other than price, I mean, we loved those indie game prices back in the day. Still, the indie program was a really cool program and a great way to introduce a bunch of new developers into the world of game development where you can actually have your game published and played by a lot of people. And it was accessible for gamers because the prices were incredibly inexpensive. By the time the Xbox One released, however, it seemed like the decision was made to fully drop the indie program altogether. Thus, moving forward, no new games would be released on, obviously, the Xbox One using the old program 
program that had previously existed. Even though with the launch of the Xbox One, the 360 would continue to live on for a couple more years before Microsoft would kind of wrap up its general ongoing support where they're like hands-on and what was going on over there. The Xbox One ended up going on to take on a new storefront that essentially just grouped indie games, arcade games, and main retail releases all together. So just the store for consumers was just an all-in-one place. So there wasn't like a separate tab just for indie games like there once was. The software that was used to make the games and bring them over to Xbox was shut down in 2013. In 2015, Microsoft even sent out a notice to their developers, letting them know that later that year, the indie support and service would be shutting down altogether. The marketplace itself would also be selected to shut down, where new purchases of some of these indie titles would no longer be able to be made. However, the people who did purchase indie games would continue to be able to play them on their console and it'd be linked to their account. And while this was disappointing, due to fan feedback, Xbox actually listened and delayed the shutdown and closure of the indie store like a month, giving people just a little extra time to maybe pick up some games that they missed out on. There was also like a generic statement made by Xbox where they were like, hey, we still support indie creators. We want them to make games as a part of our like ID at Xbox program. After the closure though, a lot of these games would never really see the light of day again. However, some of them would go on to see releases elsewhere, which was kind of surprising. There are a few games that do show up on the Xbox Series X store even that that were originally indie games like Kingdom for Cleflings or whatever that game's called. This one right here that you see on the screen, it's on the Xbox store today. Games like Murder Miners would actually see a re-release on Steam and the Xbox Marketplace as almost like a remaster with 60 FPS more support, but it's interesting to say like, hey, that game started out as a small little indie game. Castle Miner Z still exists on Steam, which is incredible. So, you know, not all was lost, but I'll always think back fondly to some of those weird indie game experiences like APOC Z. And just what a wild time it was to be able to go on, look through some weird games, spend just a few bucks, and have some crazy experiences for better or worse. And even if the game was bad, you know what? You only lost a couple of dollars. And the fact that those demos were available for free, which gave access to a ton of people who just wanted to try a game out and decide for themselves later if they want to actually buy it, was a huge plus. But you know what? We decided to look more into some of these other indie games from back in the day, because there was just so many. And it was kind of interesting to reminisce a bit about some indie games that I think a lot of us have forgotten about and then all of a sudden we talk about it and bam it just like pops up back in your mind after all of this time. Okay show of hands who here actually remembers back in the day those goofy organ trail games that were often on like school computers. I guess if you had your own Macintosh in your house you might have had this game as well. Those games were wild. I mean there was the old black and green one from before my era but I grew up with this one that was like the most cutting edge graphics or at least as cutting edge as 2D graphics on a Macintosh computer can be. I loved playing these games in school. I don't know why. I think they were just like one of the more popular picks because the game was actually fun and not like one of those dumb educational games that try to teach you things. Well, fortunately enough, I think one of the indie game developers saw an opportunity to recreate that genre of game, but for the Xbox 360 indie store, making a parody game, calling it Super Amazing Wagon Adventure. And honestly, this name kind of slaps. It's way better than the Oregon Trail, just saying. Now, sure, some of you might be familiar with the Oregon Trail, like mobile game or whatever that released a few years back, but this game is way okayer. Okay, that's definitely an exaggeration. This is a very, very, very basic bare bones game, but it had its charm, and in a way it served as like a joke of, you know, what we used to play back in the day before Xbox 360s were a thing. The game was really, really short. You could beat it relatively quickly. I don't know, you gotta hunt, you have to survive, and you have to just like make your way across the West, and it was a very basic game, but still some a bit charming. Now on the flip side, there was another game that kind of ripped off an existing game title, at least a little bit. But some of you might remember back when Adult Swim used to really heavily plug this game that they had released online to play. It was called Robot Unicorn Attack, and you might remember some of the commercials, or maybe you played the game yourself. It kind of looked like this. They did a big, heavy, heavy advertising campaign for it. Well, about 10 months after Robot Unicorn Attack released, a different game known as Techno Kitten Adventure released on the Xbox Indie Store. Now this game likely was just heavily inspired by that other game, but you know, was gonna be on the Xbox Live Indie Store. So there was something you could play in your Xbox 360 instead of having like go online, log in Facebook, all that extra stuff. This game was interesting. You like controlled this flying kitten in like a side scrolling type game, but the visuals and the soundtrack were really what like made this game special for its time. And this game would spin off beyond just the Xbox Live Indie Store. It would see releases on like the 
iOS App Store, the Android Marketplace, even Windows phones, if you guys remember those things. The game managed to stick around for a little while before it was taken off of all of the stores and is now no longer available for purchase. So rest in peace. If you played it back then, you were lucky, I guess. Okay, now this next one's also really interesting. So there's a developer studio known as Ancient that originally started out in the 1990s. They had some interesting publishing deals, like they did the Sonic the Hedgehog Game Gear release, which was like a separate version of Sonic the Hedgehog in 8-bit. They did some Streets of Rage games. They even helped develop Fusion Frenzy 2. Still, they were a small independent developer studio, and they ended up releasing a game known as Protect Me Night. And while this studio was established, you'd expect the game to fall under the Xbox Live Arcade tag, but surprisingly, it seems like this game was actually released under the Xbox Live Indie titles. Nonetheless, this was a pretty simple tower defense game, but at that time, there surprisingly wasn't that much competition in the tower defense genre, especially for like the lower price that indie games went for. And I guess the game ended up selling surprisingly well because later on it would spin off and have multiple sequels made to this title that would see full releases. Like for instance, a game known as Gata Protectors was released for the Nintendo 3DS in Japan and eventually did well enough to warrant a global release a few years later. And a third game was made called Gata Protectors Cart of Darkness, which was released on the Nintendo Nintendo Switch in Japan back in 2019 and then later was released in English in April of 2022. So yeah, I always think it's interesting how this studio utilized a program that just anybody could walk into to get a game out there that, you know, might have been smaller in scale, but still something that a lot of people clicked into and were interested in. I don't know if this game later was switched over to the Xbox Live Arcade. The information on this specific title is kind of uh, vague, but yeah, apparently it was an indie game, so it's it's on this list and we wanted to make sure we talked about it. Now, what one of the biggest indie releases that the Xbox 360 indie program has ever seen must have been Starfield. But not this Starfield, this Starfield, which was like a multi-directional shooter that was pretty basic and there isn't really much to it. It just happened to have the same name, Starfield, but I think the F is capitalized and that's all. It's just kind of funny. Maybe it's not that funny. So there was also this other game that I never actually got to play back in the day. I didn't know about it, but the game called Biology Battle, it was created by a studio known as No the Leaf Studio and Interestingly enough, this game had a unique development history. While most games on the indie store were created by like individual developers or maybe small groups, this was a studio itself, like we've talked about for a couple of certain games, but this one was different because they put a hundred thousand dollars into the development of the game. And months into development, they applied to have the game released as an Xbox Live arcade title like the regular thing that Xbox would promote. And they got declined by Microsoft and Xbox. The game wasn't, I guess, a high enough quality game for the marketplace or taken seriously enough. So they're like, you know what? We're not gonna cancel the game. Let's release it anyways. And they opted for going through the Xbox Live Indie program instead, which, you know, as you can tell, a lot of the games are very like amateur creator games. So it is interesting that the studio like went that route as well. Kind of like that other studio we talked about that did the Sonic the Hedgehog games way before. This is like a multi-directional shooter, right? How did they spend $100,000 on this? I was wondering the same thing too when I was looking into that. I was like, that's a, a hefty sum of money. That's a lot of money. This is something you learn in like, I don't know, computer science week one. When, when I was doing research on this video too, I saw a lot of like testimonials from some of the developers who talked about how the indie side of releasing games a lot of the time wasn't that lucrative, especially towards the end of the Xbox Live Indie era. There was like over 3,000 games. In the early days, there was only like a handful and then it slowly grew out. So it's interesting, one studio, they did like two or three games and later on would re-release the games on Steam and they're like, they made back more money on Steam in the first like month than those games did in a year on the indie marketplace. So. Uh, towards the end of the Xbox life, the indie side of things were definitely dying down. Maybe that's why they didn't continue it on with the Xbox One. I guess that makes sense, though, because, like, discoverability wasn't that good on the 360. Like, you would have to scroll for, like, a long time to see all 3,000 games. And I don't think they had, like, an algorithm or recommended back then. Like, a true, true recommend. Right, and it was great early on when there was just a couple of games, because then you could find all these gems and whatnot. But after a while, it was just, like, 
a lot of just random things are on there. Now, of course, with this topic, and we mentioned briefly Doritos Crash Course earlier, but obviously Xbox Live arcade games and indie games were often like hand in hand, especially before, you know, the big like retail games were coming out on the marketplace. So while Doritos Crash Course wasn't officially an indie game, I did want to at least mention it again here because its story itself is unique. Like this was a Doritos sponsored game and it was free to play, which there was only a handful of free games on the Xbox marketplace at all back then. And a lot of the indie games were very inexpensive. So Doritos Crash Course, I think is a lot of time misremembered as one of those indie games, but uh, that game was a lot of fun too. We just, I just wanted to give it that uh, that little head nod. I do have to say though, I'm kind of nostalgic for like back in the day when you found a free to play game and like it was good. Cause like there wasn't that many free to play games. Right. It was like a and then there was like, you know, it was like a 50 50 split between good and bad free to play games, but there wasn't that many. So, like, I don't know, it always felt good finding like a little a little fun one like Doritos, Doritos Crash Course, especially on the Xbox. What's interesting is Doritos had put out other games, too. Like there was this game called Harm's Way. I remember I didn't play it for more than like 30 minutes because you could get all the achievements very easily. The game itself was meh, but it was an interesting time where like these free games were randomly popping up. Uh, another one was Aegis Wings, I think is what it was called. And it was like a side shooter type game, like a space shooter. I don't know how to explain this type of genre. It was kind of fun. I mean, you could play it with your friends, which was the best benefit. I don't know if I would have even played it if it wasn't co-op. Our pickings were slim back then on what we could actually play. Now, another big part, and I can't believe I forgot about this in the actual like narrative part of the video, but a big part about the indie service overall were the demos and i think a lot of us went and tried out so many of these games because every game was required to have a playable demo where you could go and try out the game and then decide if you wanted to buy it and even though the entry level like we said very cheap it was like 60 100 microsoft points 160 microsoft points most of the time you could just go through download 15 demos and just try them out and uninstall them as you go and some of them were you know you quickly realized not worth buying but it was interesting in the earliest time of the indie program, there was a requirement that the demo had to be four minutes long and apparently due to player feedback, uh, that wasn't long enough. So they extended it to eight minutes and you could play the game for eight minutes and decide if you liked it enough to buy it. And uh, some of the games had different ways that the trials or demos worked, but the general rule was that eight minute rule. Eight minutes doesn't seem like a lot either. But I guess they're just small games, so I guess... Four minutes felt very, very short. I'm like... If you think about how many, you know, today on Steam you can refund after up until three hours of gameplay, I think. Is it three hours now? Eight minutes seems short, but I guess those games were short. And But like, what kind of game would it have to be where you download the demo, then you play for eight minutes, and then you're like, oh, this is not worth 60 Microsoft points. I mean, I don't know, dude. You gotta make them last, I guess. I also thought it was interesting how like the indie games were also often like... They were kind of treated like second class gaming citizens. Like they they had the some functionality that Xbox Live had, but like the way that like the games would display in your gamer card and stuff, they were not eligible for that. But you still could like invite your friends and like play together using Xbox Live and your gamer tag and your avatar and all that. It was almost like Microsoft was like, you guys are in, but not really. And they didn't do the uh like achievements either for the indie games. So you couldn't like rack up some gamer score. There was a big difference. Arcade games, you could get back then 200 whole gamer score, which was a lot. Indie games, not as lucky. That's interesting. I don't even remember that. Yeah, I was I was like really big into achievement hunting back in the day. So it was a big deal if I could go and get achievements and gamer score. I always felt like it wasn't even fair that the arcade games were limited to just 200 gamer score, but they were trying to do this thing where like all the 360 games had a thousand gamer score for a main release. And then I guess if DLC came out, they could get more achievements aligned with that. Then the arcade games only had 200 gamer score back then, though things have later changed where a game can have like way more gamer score than it used to be able to have. And then indie games just had nothing. So yeah, I don't know. I wish it would go back and change up some of the games like that released on the 360 era and give them more achievements because for people like me who have over 100,000 gamer score, thank you very much. <laughs> I just recently hit it after all of these years. I don't even know how much I have, I gotta be honest. You had quite a bit. One time I downloaded that like really short avatar game where you just gotta beat the tutorial to get a thousand gamer score. Oh, I remember that. You like, 
just spam the same attack over and over and over again, right? Like, that's all you had to do. I would go to the Hollywood video and try to rent that game because I just wanted the gamer score. And it was always taken out. Like, I don't know even if it was the same guy just hoarding it or, like... I don't know. It must have been just a popular game with Achievement Hunters, you know? I guess, yeah. I definitely missed out on that one. Didn't you also buy a bunch of random games? Like, you went through, like, a short phase where you're trying to get a gamer score? Yeah, there was a time where I bought, like, small, like, indie games on the Xbox One. And, like, where it was, like, where I found, like, guides. Like, get a thousand gamer score in 30 minutes or less. Another interesting thing that's worth talking about with the indie game stuff is that there was a limit at first for the people who were enrolled in the indie game program they're only allowed to put out eight games at a time if you put out more than eight games you had to like remove one of your games i guess from the program eventually they did change it in 2012 towards the end of the life of it and they allowed you to have up to 20 games but it it just seems like such a weird stipulation like if you're popping out good games do you really need to limit like which ones could be out there it's probably not for the people that put out good games it's probably for the people that put out some sloppy game i guess but they had to be peer-reviewed so you know if the other developers thought the game was too sloppy they could also just like deny it altogether i felt like that could also cause them like competition like uh what, what is the word like uh something of interest um i know what you're talking about. like uh like a uh... what is that word oh it's gonna bother me conflict of interest yeah conflict of interest i remembered it. like because like what if they're like wow this game is really good um but look at this little glitch here uh, red tape, we gotta keep our games at the top, or something like that. Yeah, actually, that doesn't seem that fair. I don't know. I just think, in general, like, looking at the indie games again makes me so nostalgic for the Xbox 360 days. Dude, getting the Xbox 360, plugging in, going online, this was my first, like, online experience, and I could finally have those parasocial relationships with the people talking in game chat and feel like, you know, like, even if I wasn't, like, wearing a mic and talking to them in Call of Duty, hearing two people argue, I just felt like I was there experiencing it it's like you sit on the on the subway and like uh or in the you know what i mean and there's like people arguing and you're like listening in and you're like oh this is kind of interesting yeah it's getting spicy or like two people becoming friends you're like oh yeah look at them they added each other yeah like that's kind of wholesome i mean there was also like the awfulness of the xbox live days but you know still one thing i kind of noticed and i don't know if this was with age but i remember back in the day when someone was really good in your game You'd be like, you try to be friends with them. Oh, nowadays, yeah, you, nowadays, you like call them a sweat lord, and you like, you like hate on them. Avoid as yeah, team, yeah. or avoid <laughs> in the future. So. No, I remember that. Or if you played really well, you would just get friend requests. Like, like, oh, that guy's good. Let me send him a friend request. I don't know. I just, I really do miss that era. And I think, I think the biggest downfall of that era, at least on the Xbox side of things, besides all of the problems Xbox One had at its launch, and them just abandoning like gaming as a focus for like a couple of years randomly i i think when the xbox one started shipping without a headset i think the initial xbox one didn't come with a headset or i'm pretty sure it didn't come with a headset you just had the connect it had the connect right and then i think after that like they removed the connect i still don't think it came with a headset i think that really started to like kill off like voice chat and voice communication for a while. It wasn't only that. They had also the controller didn't have the normal headset plug. Right. So you couldn't even use your old headset. I forgot all about that. You had to get like an adapter that was like $50. That just made the entry level to communicate so much worse. And I think that that just like put a lot of people off from like, uh, like the people who were social, like it made them seek that out elsewhere. Uh, I think it was a step in the right direction when they released the new Xbox controller that has the like uh, the ox yeah like the little ox thing down there um but uh the old ones didn't have that it was like this weird it wasn't even usb it was like this bizarre shape yeah i don't know something they made up i I don't know like yeah old xbox one controllers still had it with the ox next to it but uh eventually they just did away with it all together oh no it's still on wait is this a series x controller no that's like for the chat pad i think now I did really think that that was just dumb. And and it, it was always a pain when your controller broke too, or your adapter broke, or your headphone jack broke on those. Also, the I do have to say the, the, the sound on the Kinect, right? Like, that was like the main focus to talk. Oh, so crisp, dude. When we met Dim, he didn't have a headset because of the issues we talked with the adapter and stuff. And he would talk to us about the Kinect for, connect for oh, he would talk to us over the Kinect for two years. And like, he always just sounded like he was talking into one of those cans on a string i don't know we could never understand what he was saying he was always so distant and far away 
he'd be like yelling some stuff and he'd be cutting out and we're like, what does he say? Yeah, we're like playing Call of Duty. He's like trying to make a call out. Nobody knows what's going on. Or Rainbow Six and uh-huh. he wasn't wearing headphones. Oh yeah, he didn't he hear. Disconnect. Yeah, probably all on he mono. He didn't hear any of the yeah. footsteps. <laughs> so this is a fun video to go down memory lane on and look into and um... Yeah, I, I hope you guys kind of enjoyed us talking about it also. I feel like there's a lot. If you guys had memories of any of these games, let us know in the comments what your experience was like with some of these. And if you've never played them, I hope you enjoyed looking at what these things were, because some of them were definitely weird. Like Baby Maker Extreme. Dude, it's a weird name for a game, right? Like, I mean, yeah. Okay. I mean, this is just, I mean, it just makes it sound like it's just having intercourse in the game because, like, I don't know. Like, I mean, that's what it sounds like. It's not what it is, but. I mean, uh, I, I figured that that wouldn't be what's in the game, but, like, I don't know. I just remember, like, my friend was over and he was like, look at what game is I had. He was like, what is this? I was like, dude, trust me, it's a cool game, okay? There were those weird massage games, too, that we talked about. Oh, dude, I like... just thought of those, where you put the controller yeah, yeah, on your... Yeah, and then if you paid for the full version of the game, which no one did, you could, like, play multiplayer, and someone else could control your controller for you, and that's so weird. Yeah. I don't know. That was... I don't know. Wild times, but I do remember those two, yeah. Thanks for watching. Huge shout-out to our patrons for supporting our channel, helping us do content like this it's really nice of you guys um make sure you subscribe if you have watched this far in the video and you're not subscribed yet it takes like two more seconds on tv i know but it helps our content get rolled out to you more naturally so you can see more stuff like this uh otherwise that's it and we'll see you guys all soon with another video bye bye bye